Okay, so we'll give it uh, maybe two or three more minutes. What do you think, Belito? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, a busy time of year, but hopefully we'll get a few more, a uh, few more guests. And if not, it'll be wonderful to have the recording to share with folks, because I know there are a lot interested in this topic. Mm -hmm. All right, what do you think, Bill? Should we go ahead and get started with introductions and then as more folks join? Uh, yes, I think so. Let's let's do it. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event about the COVID-19 current and future impact and myths and facts about the vaccine uh, featuring our guest speaker, Dr. Dean Bloomberg. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Student Life and Leadership and the Professional Association's Cultural Committee uh, with the generous support of the NGEA's Pride Grant. Uh, thank you to Belina Drasil, the chair of the PA's cultural committee for bringing in Dr. Bloomberg, uh, as well to the other members of this committee, including Shanine Caruana, Bernard Adamiti, Carrie Shaw, and myself. Uh, the goal of the PA's cultural committee is to support activities that advance the intellectual and cultural life of the college. And we're proud to sponsor these college-wide events and of course, glad to have you with us. Um, before I give the floor to Belina to introduce Dr. Blumberg, uh, I'd like to ask everyone to make sure to place their microphones on mute so that we can keep the audio clear. Uh, we will save time at the end for questions and answers, so please hold any questions that you may have until the end. Uh, Belina, would you like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Blumberg? Yes, yes, yes. Um, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Blumberg, for uh, uh, gracing us with your presence today. And uh, we're delighted to have you, as the president stated. Uh, at the most opportune time to have a discourse, a discussion regarding the coronavirus, right, and its impact uh, globally. So, um, as we all know, uh, the World Health Organization, the WHO, has declared, uh, I think since March 11, 2020, uh, COVID-19 a pandemic. And our lives have been upended. Um, the freedom that we've once enjoyed has been um, has been um, curtailed uh, to some degree, well, to a lot of degree, uh, and we hate it. Well, I do. <laughs> uh, COVID nineteen has impacted millions of people globally, and has you know overwhelmed healthcare systems as well, you know, uh, in the United States and of course the world as well. Well, since the Food Administration uh, and Drug Administration, the FDA. Uh, has approved vaccines against it, um, many people have had a lot of concern, right? So you have been encouraged to be vaccinated, uh, but some of us remain concerned, especially about the uh, rapidity and in which the vaccines were, were developed, safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So all of these things com you know, combined cause Americans <laughs> to, not, to not want to be vaccinated. So Dr. Bloomberg, here is going to shed some light on the issue uh, for us, you know, in his, uh, today's presentation. And the title uh, for today's presentation is um, Current Future Impact and Myths Facts About the Vaccine. Right? So he will discuss misinformation surrounding the vaccines as well as COVID-19 uh, uh, current impact uh, today. So before I yield the floor to Dr. Blumberg, I'd like to uh, read his bio, Dr. Blomberg is professor and chief of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis Children's Hospital 
in Sacramento. He went to UC Berkeley for his undergraduate education, then to Chicago Medical School and did his internship and residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Bloomberg did his fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at UCLA and stayed there on staff until moving to Sacramento in 1996. He is head of infection prevention at the Shriners Hospital for Children in Northern California. He has provided expert testimony at numerous California legislative hearings and participated in several federal and international advocacy activities. He has worked on clinical trials with Ebola vaccine development in Liberia on behalf of NIAID. He is co-creator, executive producer, and co-host of the Kids Considered Podcast. I forgot to ask him about that. <laughs> so, Dr. Bloomberg, welcome to HCCC. Again, we're delighted to have you. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. And I'm really pleased to be here. And as you mentioned, really, COVID has completely upended um, really all, all of our lives so much. It's just a new a new world um, for us. So um, we're going to be talking today about the where we are, um, what we expect in sort of terms of the future of this pandemic, and then um, talk about the vaccines and um, how they work and some some safety concerns and some um, uh, misconceptions about the vaccine. And I have nothing, no no conflicts of interest and nothing else to disclose. Um, so what we're going to talk about is the current status of COVID-19, the transmission and how it impacts communities and really impacts communities disproportionately. Um, we'll talk about the vaccines, how they work, how they were developed, um, how well they protect, and some of the side effects, and then especially focus in on the Johnson Johnson and Johnson vaccine and the blood clots that have been in the news over the past couple weeks. Talk about some of the myths um, regarding side effects, and then the current state of vaccination. And then I think what we're all really also concerned about is the variants and how they really are are, are changing things or may change things. Um, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. And what I found in, the, in, in with this subject with COVID is that there are a lot of individual concerns that people have and unique circumstances that people have. And so I'd be happy to um, really talk about those different circumstances um, um, that we're all dealing with. And the, the, the landscape is changing every single day. So this is where we are right now. This is a map from the CDC of the US on a county level map, and it shows the rate of transmission, um, uh, the data um, that was, this is released um, weekly. And so this was released Monday of this week. So the red areas are the uh, counties that have high rates of transmission and then all the way down to blue, which have low rates of transmission. And what you can see is very high rates of transmission in the Northeast, in the upper Midwest, and then also in um, much of the South, so in Florida and Texas. It's a little bit misleading when you look at the, the map in rural areas, because some of these counties, um, for example, in Wyoming might be red, but that'll just be a handful of cases and it's a very large geographic county. So it's disproportionately represented. So I think these areas are really of concern. And of course we've heard um, currently in Michigan, where some of the hospitals have been um, overwhelmed. If you look at who's being affected by um, uh, by by COVID, um, by race and ethnicity, um, you can see in the gray bar is the percent of the U.S. population of the race or the ethnicity, and then in the red portion of the bar are those who are um, infected with COVID. And so what you can see is this is um, data uh, as of Wednesday, um, April 28th. Um, you can see that Hispanic Latino are overrepresented in terms of the number of cases um, uh, uh, that are infections that are occurring. And then if you look at um, the deaths due to um, COVID by race and ethnicity, you can see again the Hispanic Latino are overrepresented, um, a larger number of deaths compared to the population, as well as Black non Hispanic are overrepresented um, compared to the percent in the population. 
And then if you look at um, uh, the average um, number of cases in by county on the basis of the social vulnerability index over time, um, the CDC has a social vulnerability index that ranks each census tract on 15 social factors. And this includes things like poverty, lack of vehicle access, crowded housing, and, and other issues. And the orange line here is the average all counties in the US. Um, the blue line is um, those counties that are um, highly vulnerable by the social vulnerability index, and the purple line are those that are um, low, less vulnerable by this index. And so what you can see is, especially during these surges, that it's clear that counties that are more vulnerable, have more social vulnerability, are overrepresented. Um, and have um, suffer the most with infections. And so there's several different um, racial and social vulnerability disparities that are existing in the US in relationship to COVID infection. And um, there's several different factors that can account for this. Some of these may be social factors such as crowded living conditions, um, food and housing insecurity. Some of them may be lack of access to healthcare, which leads to increasing comorbidities, things like obesity, diabetes, um, asthma, which the, can then result in more severe disease. And some is that an increased proportion of household contacts may be essential workers in some of these groups, and that puts them on the front lines and at increased risk um, of infection, and then bringing that home to family members. This is one of the models that I like to use in terms of trying to predict where we're going with um, COVID-19. This um, graph is over time, shows the daily number of cases over time and the current projection. This is from the University of Washington, the IHME, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. And I found their model to be um, uh, particularly um, effective and generally correct. What we've seen over time in the US is we had this first surge, this first wave in the spring of last year. And that, of course, was when the New York metropolitan area was, was highly affected and uh, many of the, of the hospitals were overwhelmed. We had the second wave in the summer, and we believe that this was due to likely the um, lifting of the lockdowns too early. Um, and then we had the third wave um, around the holidays um, last year. So following Thanksgiving, Christmas and New Year's, where there was more travel, families getting together from different households, less distancing. And so we had uh, the, the biggest wave back then. Since then, we've had decreasing number of cases. There was concern at the beginning of April that we might be entering another wave, but it looks like this has plateaued. And we do expect that this to decrease. So that's what this current model shows is continuing decreasing over the summer. And so in order to explain this decrease over the summer, I like to go back to um, 2009 with influenza H1N1, and that's the influenza viruses. We're all familiar with those are transmitted generally in the winter. They're winter respiratory viruses, and in the summer, we get a break from them. And it's because the conditions, the temperature and the humidity favor transmission during the winter. And also people are inside more during the winter. So people are more crowded. So there's more opportunities for transmission um, in the winter. And then the, once people get infected, there's less people who are vulnerable. And in the summer where conditions are less favorable and there's more immunity throughout the community, then the infections die off. So we're hoping that this summer with a combination of previous infection and immunization that we'll have enough uh, immunity within our communities that will have decreased transmission in the summer because coronaviruses are traditionally transmitted in the winter. In 2009, with influenza H1N1, we saw continuing transmission. Um, it emerged in the spring and we had continuing transmission all summer until we had vaccines that were available and we were able to achieve that immunity. So I, I think the same thing is going to happen and I'm hopeful that we won't have a high rate of transmission this upcoming summer like we had um, last year in the summer. I'd like to move on and talk about vaccines. And before we talk about vaccines, we'll have to talk about the pathogenesis, so how these vaccines were developed. 
So um, this is a schematic of a coronavirus, and you can see that it has a, a membrane and then these spikes. So we're familiar with the, the spike protein, and then the RNA is on the inside, the genetic material. So the spike protein appears to be key, and that's what connects to our ACE2 receptors in our respiratory tract, and that allows the virus to gain entry into our cells, and then the RNA is released, it's translated, um, and then it goes into the, the cell mechanism, it gets translated in, into um, and multiplies and then is packaged back up and then the virus is released so that it can affect other cells and other people. But the whole key to this, the whole initiation of infection is right here where the virus um, attaches to the cell. So when scientists were figuring out how to develop a vaccine, that's that's really was the focus, figuring if we can get immune to the spike protein, then we can disrupt this initial uh, event at infection, and then we can end up um, preventing infection. So to go all the way back to how vaccines work, um, we have the vaccine, we figure out what we want to put in the vaccine, and in this case, um, it's indicated here by this round ball with the spikes on it, and we give this vaccine, and the vaccine ends up going to our um, immune cells um, after we administer the antigen in the vaccine. Um, it goes to the macrophages, the macrophages ingest the virus. And what they do is then they, they ingest the pathogen, the, the antigen, and then what they do is they digest it and they take little parts of it and they present this. And what they do is they present this to other cells in our immune system, T and B cells. Um, and then those T and B cells um, end up um, making um, the immunity that we know to the pathogen. So the B cells are the plasma cells and so um, when the antigen gets presented to them, they make these Y-shaped antibodies, and the antibodies um, are produced against the pathogen, and then the T cells um, are another arm of the immune system, that cell-mediated immunity. That's a little bit more complicated, but that's also important for um, immunity. And then what you end up with is development immunity against the pathogen without actually suffering the disease. And so hopefully these antibodies that the vaccine induces will then, when you encounter the actual pathogen in the real world, the antibodies end up neutralizing the pathogen so it can't cause any infection and it can't cause any harm. So that's the whole theory by vaccine about vaccine development. There's several different ways that you can deliver the antigen. For the, um, for the COVID vaccines, the initial vaccines that were developed were messenger RNA vaccines. And the idea behind these messenger RNA vaccines is you take the messenger RNA, um, it's enclosed in a lipid nanoparticle, and the reason that it's in the lipid nanoparticle is otherwise we're not sure where it would get delivered. And this favors delivery inside the cells. It ends up getting inside cells, and then the messenger RNA, which encodes just for the spike protein, is then released, and then our own cells goes into the ribosome, gets translated, and then through the Golgi complex, ends up producing the protein, which is the spike protein, which is then presented on the cell surface. So um, it's a little bit different way, rather than delivering the spike protein directly, it's delivered through the messenger RNA. And so what this looks like again is we give in this lipid nanoparticle the spike protein um, encoded messenger RNA um, is taken up by the antigen presenting cell. The spike protein is translated. It's on the surface. It's presented to different T cells as well as B cells. When it's presented to the B cells, the B cells then produce neutralizing antibody. When it gets to the T cells, this results in cell mediated immunity. So those are the messenger RNA vaccines. Those are the Pfizer-BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines. And then this is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is the adenovirus um, vaccine. This is a DNA vaccine. It's a very similar principle. What happens is they've constructed an adenovirus, a common cold virus, um, and this is a non-replicating virus, which means it's, it's a virus that can get into the cell once, but then it doesn't multiply at all. So it can't cause any kind of disease like a cold or anything like that. 
And so this adenovirus, again, has a segment in it that delivers the segment uh, uh, that's been um, put into it of the DNA that encodes for the spike protein. And the spike protein then is then translated, it's then produced, and in the antigen presenting cell in a very similar manner, um, interacts with the, um, the T cells to produce cell mediated immunity and the B cells um, to produce the antibodies. So it's the giving the genetic material for the spike protein in a slightly different form. So this is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, the reason that these platforms were chosen for vaccination is because they've been worked on for years and they're basically plug and play platforms. It's very easy to manufacture the vaccine. It's very easy to get that segment, the genetic segment into the vaccine and then rapidly ramp up um, production. And, and so these were vaccines that were developed in case there was a pandemic. So there, they were just all ready and waiting and much quicker way to get these um, uh, out there and available to the public and have been used before. And here's the results from the studies. So this is um, the efficacy studies. This is from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The blue line shows the cumulative number of cases over time since vaccination at time zero. And this is in the placebo group. The red line shows the cumulative number of cases in the vaccine group over time. They're both vaccinated, uh, the, or the vaccine group gets the vaccine at time zero, the placebo group gets the placebo at time zero. And then you can see starting at about day 12 is when the lines start diver diverging. And what you get is then protection in the vaccine group, but a steady number of cases developing in the placebo group. So for the Pfizer vaccine, there's another dose of the vaccine given here at day 21, and people are felt to be fully immune two weeks later. But even just after that first dose, 12 days later, there's enough immunity that you can see that that immunity is developing. If you look at the results from the Moderna vaccine, it's very similar. Um, and what you see is again in the in in this graph, the blue line is the Moderna um, uh, vaccine um, recipients. The gray line is the placebo recipients. The Moderna vaccine is given on a different schedule: one dose at time zero, one dose um, at four weeks later, day 28. And again, right around day 12 is when these lines diverge, where you start seeing protection in the vaccine group. And again, very good protection. So over 90% um, efficacy, over 90% protection um, against disease. This is a result from the um, uh, from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine study. This is just a one-dose study. And what you see is the, they have, uh, the vaccine group um, is in the blue line. And about two weeks later, the blue line starts diverging from the red line. The placebo um, uh, recipients continue to get infected. Some of the, uh, the people in the vaccine group continue to get um, infected. But that does result in a 66% overall vaccine um, protection with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 93% protection against hospitalization, and no deaths were seen in the vaccine group. So 100% protection against deaths with the one-dose Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine. Now, one of the questions that scientists have had is, this is great that these vaccines protect so well against disease, but we were wondering if they would also protect against transmission. So if they would provide enough protection so that we would get less transmission in our communities. And one of the studies that showed this very well is this study, which was published in, in February. And this is based on the Israeli experience with the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccine. And what this study showed is what this is showing over time is the, the subjects again get um, the first vaccine dose at time zero, the second vaccine dose at day 21, and in the blue line is the vaccinated and in the red line are the unvaccinated individuals. And so the cumulative number of asymptomatic infections, these, these patients are being swabbed, um, starts decreasing um, around day 21 after the first dose of vaccine. So they decrease um, over time, and so that's very promising. And you can look follow this out even further um, by different time periods to see what the um, how, how the asymptomatic infection um, occurs. And if you look at um, go all the way down to the 
um, uh, after the second dose, seven days, one week after the second dose of the vaccine, there's 90% decrease in asymptomatic infections um, in the vaccine recipients. So this is very promising. And what this shows is that if we vaccinate enough people, there'll be enough people immune so that even unvaccinated individuals will be protected. This will provide herd immunity so that unvaccinated people or people who may have a poor vaccine response, maybe because they have a weakened immune system from cancer chemotherapy or something else, that they'll be protected too. So this is the kind of information that we need um, in order to um, think about returning to our previous way of life, our pre-pandemic way of life, the, the type of life that we led where we were just interacting, sitting down at restaurants and e eating with our friends and families, where we were going to houses of worship or um, large sporting events or concerts or other, other um, arts venues, um, and really just interacting as we always did. Um, and that's because these vaccines protect not only um, people against infection, but they prevent um, asymptomatic infection and then presumably transmission also. Now, when we talked about all these different vaccines, they all have different efficacies, but I'd just like to caution that, you know, these vaccine studies were performed at different time periods and with different intensity of transmission and with different circulating variants, which we'll talk about in a bit. And they've also were performed at different geographic locations and in different populations with different study methodologies, different study endpoints, um, for example, and different ways of looking for infection. And um, the, so, so the confidence intervals may overlap, and so that means that the differences between these vaccine efficacies um, may not be statistically significant. So I think it's important to take um, these efficacies with a grain of salt. All these vaccines work very well, and the efficacies are not directly comparable. So right now we've got the three vaccines that are available in the US, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the Moderna vaccines. Both of them are messenger RNA vaccines. Both of them are two dose with slightly different schedules. The Pfizer vaccine was studied down to age 16. The Moderna vaccine studied down to age 18. And then the Johnson & Johnson or the Janssen vaccine, that's a slightly different vaccine, a DNA vaccine, has the advantage of one dose rather than two doses and is for 18 years um, and up. These vaccines, um, you know, any vaccine can be used, the FDA, the CDC, nobody's saying that one of them is preferable to the others, but they're not interchangeable. They just haven't been studied um, giving like one dose Pfizer and one dose Moderna vaccine. Those studies are being done now. They haven't been done yet, so, so we're not recommending that that be done. And I do want to talk also about one of the concerns we've had the, with the vaccines. People may have heard about the CDC health alert that came out a couple of weeks ago. And this was in response to the um, blood clots, a rare form of blood clots, a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis that occurred with a low platelet count. Platelets are very important for blood clotting. It's a blood component that we all have. Um, and the platelets, usually they're normal, and that results in normal blood clotting. Um, when blood clots if, uh, uh, are dangerous, sometimes the platelet counts are high and, and, and abnormal, and that results in a condition that can lead to more blood clotting. These were unusual blood clots because they had a low platelet count and resulted in these unusual blood clots in unusual locations. And they were reported to after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. They appear to be more common in young women um, and less common in, in men and older men and women. And it was interesting because we saw similar side effects um, among the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is approved for use in the UK and Europe and other countries. And we saw similar signals um, with, with, with that. And so that's led to some concern. So when you take a step back and look at that, the CDC and, and the FDA said we need to take a pause with vaccination and further understand that. Because if you look at the vaccine, we have clear benefits that we know from the vaccine. It's 66% um, you know, protection against symptomatic disease, 100% uh, preventing death due to COVID-19. 
the single dose is a real advantage for some populations. So for example, those people who are homebound, um, where, where you'd have to do home visits, going there once rather than doing multiple visits is clearly an advantage. Outreach to homeless population is an advantage. Maybe people who are afraid of side effects or afraid of needles, don't wanna get shots, having a single dose would be better than getting two doses. So there's some advantages to this vaccine versus the other vaccines. But there's also potential harms with this thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, TTS, you might see it abbreviated. And um, what they found were 15 confirmed blood clots out of almost 8 million doses administered. And so what you need to do is take the uh, take a step back and evaluate the benefits for versus the risks. So the CDC and the FDA did that. One of the things they did is they um, uh, did some safety monitoring review. Um, they did this before. This was just released this morning. And what they did was they looked at all the different um, uh, all, all the different risk of the side effects following vaccination and looked for any kind of, of reaction following vaccination with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, looking at things like fatigue, fever, rash, and any kind of injection site reaction, any systemic reaction. To the, graded these by severity, they looked at it by different day, and what they found was out of nearly eight million doses of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that were administered, they the review of the safety monitoring data found that 97 percent of reported reactions after vaccine receipt were non-serious, and they found 17 of these thrombotic events with thrombocytopenia reported. And because of that, then they took a look again, they really took a look at the risks and the benefits. And so they, they had a theoretical uh, model where they said, let's administer 9.8 million doses over a six month period to everybody 18 years of age and older. And they estimate that the risk would be the development of 26 of these um, blood clot cases. Um, and then the benefits, they gave a range on the benefits depending on vaccine uptake and the rate of transmission, whether it was low transmission or moderate transmission. And you can see the benefits are nearly 4,000 to 9,000 fewer hospitalizations, uh, between about 1,000 and 2,000 fewer ICU admissions, and between 500 and about 1,500 fewer deaths. So if you take a look at the risks versus the benefits, I mean, clearly the benefits of vaccination, you know, more than 20 times decreased number of deaths versus these blood clots. And so that's why um, earlier this week, the um, CDC and the FDA did come out with this published statement that the updated recommendations are to continue using this vaccine. It is a rare side effect, but the benefits of immunization outweigh the risks. And I think one of the things that we've learned from this whole episode is that we have a very robust um, vaccine safety system in the U.S. We're able to detect these very rare events. We're able to figure out what the risk is, what the benefits is, and we're able to put this into perspective to figure out what's best for any individual, whether they should get vaccinated or not, and what's the safest thing um, for people. So that's that's my take-home point from it. Well, let's take a look at some of the um, COVID vaccine um, myths that have been out there. I know some people have been reluctant to be vaccinated early on. Of course, there's a big rush for people wanting to get the vaccine. I was among those. I was vaccinated very early on since healthcare workers were prioritized. So one thing I hear is that the vaccine were developed too fast to be safe. Well, they were developed pretty fast, and you have to realize that that's because an unprecedented effort, an unprecedented amount of money and resources were really devoted to developing the these COVID-19 um, vaccines. Um, really, everything stopped. You know, hospitals, um, pharmaceutical companies, researchers, epidemiologists. Um, the National Institutes of Health, the FDA, the CDC, everybody stopped pretty much everything that they were doing in order to devote all available resources to develop COVID-19 vaccines. So they were developed really, really fast. Um, but these were not approved under the emergency use authorization by the FDA until they had those phase three studies, the large phase three studies. And so you can take a look at the data yourself. It's all online. And I did this myself before I was vaccinated. 
for Pfizer, there are more than 34,000 subjects in the pivotal phase three studies. For Moderna, more than 30,000 subjects. And for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, more than 39,000 participants in the, these vaccine studies. All this information is available online. All the information that the FDA reviewed is available online. And I would encourage anybody who's skeptical about the data to take a look at that themselves. It's all, it's all available. And it's understandable that some people may not be early adopters of the vaccine. They might say, well, let's wait and see what happens. But I'm not sure really what it takes, because at this point, there's been more than 230 million doses of these vaccines administered in the U.S. So I think we really have robust experience with these vaccines. Some people say the vaccine um, gives you COVID. Well, there's no way. They don't contain the virus and they don't replicate. So the vaccines can't give you COVID. You can be vaccinated and still get COVID. The vaccines don't work 100%. You could get the vaccine today and get COVID tomorrow because maybe you, um, maybe you caught it yesterday. Um, so that can happen, but the vaccines can't give you COVID. Um, I've heard since these are RNA and DNA vaccines, people were concerned that the vaccine will alter your DNA. Realize that the messenger RNA and the Johnson & Johnson adenovirus DNA, the, these end up in the cytoplasm of our cells. It does not enter the nucleus of our cells. The nucleus of our cells, that's where our DNA is based. So there's no way that they can really alter our host DNA. And they're rapidly degraded. What happens is the DNA and the RNA from the vaccines are transcribed. And within a few hours, the RNA and DNA, it's gone from our bodies. It's, it's metabolized. Some people say, I'll skip the second dose of the vaccine because the first one is good enough and then I'll avoid more side effects. Well, there are more side effects with the second dose of the vaccine series. But if you skip the second dose, um, you know, then it doesn't work as well. So there's two reasons to get the second dose. One is it results in a boost to your immunity. It's higher, you get more immunity. Um, the other is that you probably get longer lasting immunity. And so that's why you need two doses in the vaccine series, except for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. That one's just one dose. There's a rumor on social media that the vaccines cause infer infertility. This is a really interesting one. There is no evidence that COVID-19 vaccination causes any problems with pregnancy, including the development of the placenta or, or fertility. There's no evidence that fertility problems are a side effect of COVID-19 vaccines. Some people have said, but the spike protein is similar to a spike protein on the placenta. You know, that, that just doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. If that, you know, if it was similar enough, then getting COVID would affect fertility. So, so wouldn't you want to get not get COVID by getting the vaccine? So th this has just not been shown not to be true. Uh, some people say I don't need to be vaccinated because I'm immune immune because I had COVID. Well, it's true that getting COVID does give you a good immune response, but the immune response following immunization is equivalent or better than the immune response following infection. So you're probably more protected after having the vaccine than having um, infection. Um, the vaccines implant a microchip. I've heard that one and, you know, I don't know where that one came from. We still don't know the long-term side effects. So this is a common one that I've been hearing from people lately. You know, with, with vaccines, almost all side effects show up within a week or two of being vaccinated. And even delayed side effects show up within two months. And that's why the FDA required the pivotal phase three studies to have at least two months safety follow-up following um, immunization to make sure that any of these rare delayed side effects wouldn't show up. Show up. All the rare serious side effects that have occurred with all the other vaccines that have ever been developed have happened within six weeks of immunization. So these you know, delayed reactions are things like with the smallpox vaccine, which we're not routinely using anymore, that that one can cause inflammation of the heart. That happens within six weeks of vaccination. So I, you know, I do feel that we have um, robust safety follow-up with our um, vaccines. And in terms of long-term side effects, we have enough experience to not be worried about that. So let's take a look at um, how vaccination is going in the U.S. 
Um, what this slide shows is the COVID vaccinations in the U.S. as of yesterday. Um, what you can see is that 43% of the total population has had at least one dose. 30% in the U.S. are fully vaccinated. And if you look at our initial target area, our priority area of vaccination, this is really impressive. I think 82% of those 65 years of age and older have had at least one dose and 68% are fully vaccinated. So um, we've already administered over 230 million vaccine doses in the U.S. So, so it's really been, been happening very rapidly. This next slide shows um, the total doses administered um, uh, by rate of population um, in the U.S. The darker areas uh, as a higher rate of vaccination within states. So you can see that the northeast, the darker bluer colors, um, uh, New Mexico, um, as well as California, Oregon, and some of the upper Midwest have done better jobs of administering vaccine and, and outreach to um, getting the population um, immunized where some of the South has not done quite as well um, in terms of vaccine administration. So that's that's of concern. This um, slide shows the count of the total daily doses that have been administered since vaccine vaccination started um, in the U.S. Um, uh, what's interesting on this slide, as you can see, uh, every seven days there seems to be a pause. So that's Sunday. That's every Sunday. So there's vaccination clinics on Saturday. Those drop off, but not much on Sunday. Um, the seven-day moving average is indicated in the red line. So we had a gradual increase in the number of cases. Um, until um, earlier this month and um, at the beginning of April, now we've had um, a, a bit lower number of doses administered. So it appears that our um, supply has caught up with demand in the U.S. Um, currently we're administering approximately two and a half million doses um, uh, per day um, in the U.S. So the vaccine delivery is still going on, but I think there are people who are still hesitant um, and will need to be convinced that it's for their own good to be vaccinated. It's for their own good as well as the good of, of everybody in our communities to be immune to COVID so that we can um, open things up more. Um, in addition to the three vaccines that we have, there are other vaccines under development. Um, I mentioned the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that's similar to the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, except it uses a different adenovirus strain. It's a non-replicating chimpanzee adenovirus. This one is in use in UK, Europe, India, um, Africa, and many other um, areas of the world. Um, this one has about a 76% efficacy, two doses is 82% protection, and this has also been found to cut transmission by at least two-thirds. And then the Novavax vaccine is a protein-based vaccine. It's really interesting. They take an insect virus and that infects moth cells, and then it's instructed to produce the spike protein, which is then harvested and purified into a vaccine. It has about 90% protection. So this is more of a traditional protein-based vaccine, kind of like when you get a tetanus shot um, as the Novavax. That one, um, we're hopeful that they submit for FDA approval within the next month or no or so, and it might be available within two months or so. Next, I'd like to talk about the variants because they um, have been very concerning. And so the variants um, occur because viruses constantly change through mutation. And a variant has one or more mutations that differentiate itself from other variants that are in circulation. These genetic variations occur over time, and they can lead to the emergence of new variants that may have different characteristics. So for this coronavirus, for SARS-CoV-2, mutations that occur in the receptor binding domain um, illustrated here of the spike protein, those are the ones that are of particular concern because these mutations may result in more efficient or stronger binding to our ACE2 receptors and this may re lead to a higher rate of transmission or more efficient replication, like entering the cell faster. And more efficient replication can lead to higher concentrations of the virus, and that can lead to more severe disease. So that's why it's important to monitor for these variants. We're all familiar with this, for example, with influenza viruses that mutate all the time. And that's why some, some influenza viruses cause more severe disease. And some of them, we need to get vaccinated every year to keep up with the variation that occurs. So the three 
Um, the variants of concern um, show, shown here are the UK variant, the South African and the Brazilian variants, and the areas where they occur. And really, the, one that's, the ones that seem very important are this N501Y variant, which is an amino acid substitution. And this one um, results in increased transmission. And the other one of concern is the E484K. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about that as EEK. Um, and that one um, appears to be different enough that infection with previous strains um, may not result in, um, a, a, in protection. It, it changes the confirmation enough. So looking at the strains um, of concern, um, you can see that the UK variant, the, the mutation results in it being about 50% more transmissible um, than previous strains and 65% increased mortality and 65% increased risk of death. But the good news about the UK variant is that our current vaccines appear to be effective against it, so it doesn't escape vaccine-induced immunity. The South African variant is about 50% more transmissible. We're not sure if it causes more severe disease, and current vaccines appear to be less effective against this variant. The Brazilian variant is probably more transmissible and probably causes more severe disease, but we really don't have good data on that. And the current vaccine potentially is less effective, but this variant hasn't been studied as much. And then the California variants appear to be about 20% more transmissible. They might be, be associated with more severe disease, but our current vaccines appear to be effective. So in, in terms of the variants, it's important to monitor for that. And the CDC is mo monitoring for that. So this is US data over time. So this is different time periods starting at the end of January and every two week time period showing the proportion um, of viruses that are in circulation. So this is the these light blue ones are the original um, strains that we were um, that were circulating in the US. And then the um, other variants are shown over time. The one of concern, this is the California uh, variant, the B117, this is the UK variant. And you can see the UK variant in the light orange has gradually increased over time. So the latest data we have um, as of earlier this month is it was accounting for about 60% of transmission in the US, but it, it varies by region. Um, so um, if you look by region, um, you can see, for example, in um, the, the UK variant, again, in the light orange um, area, you can see this is in the Northeast, much of the, um, much of the South and the Midwest. Um, it's occurring, the darker orange colors here, these are the California variants, so they're more common in California, uh, less common in other parts of the country. And then the lavender portion of these graphs, this is the, the so-called New York variant, which you can see is more predominant in the Northeast and less predominant in other parts of the country. So we think, for example, right now in the upper Midwest where Michigan is having a very tough time, we think that's because there's a very large proportion of the UK variant um, in, in um, Michigan as well as Wisconsin, which is more transmissible and causes more severe disease. And that's why um, they're, they're having a, a tougher time there. So we can tackle this problem. Um, we can modify the vaccines to um, target these variants. So our current prevention measures office protections against some variants. Um, we need to um, make sure that we have more people vaccinated. The more people who are vaccinated, the less transmission there will be, the less replication. The less the virus replicates, the less it can mutate and cause these new variants. And then we're likely going to need to update the vaccines periodically. And so Moderna and Pfizer are launching booster studies of current vaccines and develop second generation vaccines against some of the variant. Um, uh, Moderna is also um, uh, modifying vaccines to look at different, different other variants. Um, and then um, a variant a combination vaccines are being developed, a multivalent vaccine with like the, the current strain and perhaps variants of concern like the South African and Brazilian strains, which really right now account for just a few percent of the strains that are circulating in the US, but might be of concern to develop later. 
Um, finally, I just want to talk about the um, changing recommendations from the CDC. One of the advantages of being fully vaccinated, so two weeks past, past your last dose, two weeks past the second dose for the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines, or for the only dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you're considered fully vaccinated. And the CDC has um, uh, changes that now if you're fully vaccinated, you can visit with others fully vaccinated indoors and outdoors and be unmasked to visit with unvaccinated people from a single household as long as they are at low risk for severe disease. And so this allows, for example, grandparents to go visit their grandchildren who may not be old enough to be vaccinated. And there's no restrictions on domestic travel um, at all and may travel people who are fully vaccinated may travel internationally i know right now a lot of a lot of the world is still closed so there's not that much international travel um, but they do recommend continuing to mask um, and distance in public because we don't know who our contacts are when we go to the farmer's market or the grocery store. We don't know who's vaccinated and who's unvaccinated. So the, so even people fully vaccinated are recommended to continue to, to mask in those situations. So I'd just like to summarize, I think, well, some of the major things that are going on with COVID um, in the current situation. There's continued risk of transmission. Um, we have disproportionate impact of transmission on Black non-Hispanics and Hispanic Latino communities, as well as socially vulnerable communities um, are disproportionately affected. We have three vaccines that are available in the U.S. We have a robust vaccine safety system, and there's more vaccines um, that are on the way. Um, the more we have, the better. Um, and we do need to monitor these new variants. They may be more highly transmissible. Um, they may cause more severe disease, and it's possible that they might evade vaccine-induced immunity. So we may need to get further vaccinated um, uh, in, in, in the coming months to years. That is all I was going to talk about today, um, and I would be happy to hear anybody's comments or respond to any um, questions um, or views that other people have. Thank you so much, Dr. Bloomberg. Um, and just before we get started with the q and I'd like to remind everyone that Dr. Bloomberg is a visiting guest expert, so he won't be able to speak to any of the you know concerns specific you have to the college. Um, I will put the in the chat the link to the email for the return to campus task force. Uh, we do have Dr. Reber and Kathy Smith winning with us here today. We'll, we'll try not to put them on the spot. Um, so if you have a question for Dr. Bloomberg about the vaccine, uh, please raise your hand or type it in the chat and I'll call on you. So anybody with a question? Uh, so Kathy, go ahead. Dr. Bloomberg, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm part of the health and safety committee and we do a lot of the vaccine education, but we like to hear from all sides. And I did learn a whole lot, which um, I'm your resident respiratory therapist and I cut my teeth in pediatric and neonatal intensive care. I mean, I work forever in a cystic fibrosis center. So I know infectious disease from that point of view. And one, so one comment and one question. Just so you know, here in the Northeast, we've got great marketing for Shriners Children's Hospital, and I love your spokesperson, Alec. He is the best. <laughs> I even look him up on YouTube. So <laughs> kudos to Alex. So now here's one of the questions that has come up in health in our health and safety committee. Being that I oversee a lot of the health programs, we have nurses and other people, students at a clinical. So we had one student nurse and then there was a colleague, a physician. So usually student nurses or maybe the colleagues are tested every day wherever they work, right? When I work a couple of days a month where I'm at, I'm always tested. So even though they've both been vaccinated with say Pfizer many months ago, two of them came up positive with the surveillance, right? But no symptoms. So my question to you, is this colonization or what are your thoughts? I mean. We're very interested. This is happening a little bit. Everybody's safe, but I would like a better answer to bring forward as it keeps coming up. Yeah, I've seen that situation also where people who are vaccinated, they're asymptomatic and yet they screen positive. They have a positive antigen or they have a positive PCR swab. 
Um, and so what we think is going on is that they're vaccinated, they're pretty much immune, but they still can be asymptomatically infected. And what the studies show in, in those is you can look at the concentration of the virus in the swab um, by looking at the PCR test, the, the cycle threshold, and it's a lower concentration than asymptomatic infection in unvaccinated individuals. So we think that they're asymptomatically infected. We do um, not have them work, so we do have them quarantine for 10 days from that first positive swab. Um, that's, that's the CDC recommendations. Um, and if they remain asymptomatic, then they can return um, to work after that 10 day quarantine. Um, it is a lower concentration of the virus, likely because they are um, uh, partially immune. And so they don't get um, they, they don't get um, uh, symptomatic. Um, that's probably so they're still protected against getting um, disease, but we will see some breakthrough. I mean, the Israeli study showed 90% decrease, but not 100% decrease in terms of asymptomatic infection. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll ask a question if nobody else ends up. Nobody else is on, so I'll go. Can I go, uh, Lauren? Yes. So, uh, Dr. Bloomberg, uh, you know, uh, you you covered all facets, so it, it's kind of hard now to um, for someone to ask because you've covered all facets. But I found one that you know uh, I can ask. Um, you you detailed out the mechanism in which uh, our body can be trained. To produce antibodies um, in the case of the vaccine and so on and so forth, how the plasma cells can lead with the antibodies and, and so on. So uh, my question is, I'm not sure if, if this directive has been rescinded, uh, where a previously infected individuals still have to take the vaccine. Uh, why would that be necessary? If they already had uh, produced the antibodies and now they have to be vaccinated again to produce more antibodies. Like some people cannot comprehend that, do not comprehend that. That doesn't make sense to them. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's a, it, it, there's, there, we still have a lot more questions on immunity following either disease or immunization. We know with other coronaviruses, the ones that cause the common cold, for example, that those usually, once we get infected with those strains, we're immune for about a year or two, and then we can get reinfected with the exact same strain. Um, with this infection, with SARS-CoV-2, it does cause a more invasive infection, um, and so immunity is not exactly the same. We know that reinfection is rare within three months of infection, but then after a while, the antibodies gradually wane over time. We don't have a blood test that can tell us if somebody's immune or not. We look at the level of the antibodies. If they're high, they make us feel better, but we can't say if you're over such and such a level that you're absolutely immune. We can do that with other vaccine preventable diseases, like for example, with, um, with chicken pox or with um, hepatitis B, we can do that, but we don't have a, a correlate of immunity yet with that. So all we can talk about is with our experience, we know that if you compare the immune response following somebody who's been vaccinated compared to somebody who's been infected, that the immune response is either the same or better following vaccination compared to infection. So we do feel that vaccination will result in more durable immunity compared to having disease. And that's why the CDC recommends that even previously infected individuals should get vaccinated but they also say, since reinfection is rare within three months of infection, that you could wait up to 90 days before you get vaccinated and you're probably protected during that time. Do we have any other questions? Lisa? Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your information. Um, I am just curious if we are going to see this. Uh, of course, it's a virus. It's going to continue to uh, mutate. Uh, if much as like with the 1918, 1920 flu pandemic that we are going to um, you know, have a series of vaccinations on an almost yearly basis to kind of continue to combat this because obviously 
it's a virus, um, its chance of eradication are pretty low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, the inter if, you, if you go back and you look at these coronaviruses, when we had SARS the first time around in 2002, 2003, you know, a very small number of people were infected and then it disappeared. And, you know, everybody in the medical community and epidemiologists congratulated themselves on what a great job they did and how they, they isolated and, uh, people and enough to prevent further infection. But I still don't know why that disappeared, why that didn't stay around. That's to me, it's I, 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 it's still a mystery why it like appeared and then it like disappeared. Um, this one obviously has caused much more um, infection, and uh, there's no way that I think it's going to be eliminated from the face of the earth. I think it's going to stay with us. I think it is going to be part of our routine life, and I see it being placed in a category similar to influenza that will have waves of infection every winter, that it'll probably be a routine immunization. I don't know how often we're going to need to be immunized. There's two reasons that we're going to need to be re-immunized. One is for waning immunity, and the other is to try to keep up with the new variants, depending on how significantly they, the, the virus mutates. Um, I've heard the Pfizer and Moderna CEOs have talked about how there will need to be re-immunization within um, probably every, they've said every nine months. I've not seen the data though. I've only seen the data to six months and the data that's been publicly available suggests that immunity lasts at least six months. But um, I haven't, I'm not sure why they say that, but that's obviously of concern. Nine months is pretty awkward. Um, it'd be better if it was a year, right? Because like we're used to that, at least with influenza vaccine, and they're already studying combination COVID slash influenza vaccine. So then potentially you wouldn't have to get an extra shot if you're getting your flu shot every year. So we're just going to have to see how it plays out. But I anticipate this is going to, this is the new normal. It's going to, we're going to. We're, we're, it's going to be around, um, we're, it's going to be a danger, but we've lived with influenza also. Um, and so we'll learn to live with it. And I, we're going to go back to, at some point, we'll have enough immunity within our communities to have our large gatherings again. Thank you. I, I figured as much because I do understand that um, the influenza shots that we, you know, choose to receive on an annual basis um, are really based upon variations of that original pandemic in 1918 to 1920. So that that's just a, to me a given that how long these viruses can last and how efficacious they really can be. So thank you. Thank you. So we have a, a question in the chat from Joshua, uh, and the question is, what is the percentage of those that have been vaccinated but then contract COVID-19? Yeah, you know, I don't have that number. Um, what I can tell you is it's a little bit misleading when we talk about um, the efficacy. So if we say 95% efficacy in these vaccine trials, that suggests that maybe there's a 5% risk of getting infected, but it's actually much lower than that. So it's 95% um, uh, protection in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group, but not everybody in the placebo group is getting infected, right? Only a small proportion are getting infected. So the vaccines likely, if you're vaccinated, your likelihood of getting infected is somewhere lower than 1%. Um, if you run the numbers, and it might be lower than 0.1%, because not everybody's going to get infected. Um, and then everybody has different risk factors. So, for example, if you don't if you don't go out from your house, if you're only around vaccinated people, if you're always wearing a mask, you'll have very low risk of infection. But if you're home and you're crowded and somebody in your household gets infected, you can't avoid them. Um, then you're going to have a high exposure. And even if you're immunized, that might overcome your vaccine-induced immunity. So a higher exposure like that. So I don't have a precise number on that. But um, my fallback position is always that vaccines work, but they don't work 100%. Uh, Lauren's Kathy again. Uh, I have a question. It's a tiny bit off topic, but it's global health. What's happening in India, we have enormous Indian population in New Jersey. It is gigantic. And um, just in your professional opinion, what do you think might be the number one 
technique to halt some of this. I know treatment right now is just off the charts. I mean, a little bit of oxygen all over the place for me, it's just, it's a postage stamp. But what do you think might be one public health measure that might help halt some of these numbers, these, this, some of the mortality? Well, we know that we can control infection with even without vaccine. We can end this pandemic without, without the development of vaccines. We saw that that happened in China, for example, when they had a severe, complete lockdown and basically 100% mask use. We know that masks decrease risk of transmission by, by more than two thirds, even without social distancing. We know being three feet away from somebody results in 90% decreased risk of infection. Being six feet away results in 95% decreased risk of transmission. So we've got solid data that masking and social distancing can end a pandemic, can end transmission. And, and, and that, that has occurred. So that would be the number one thing is, is masking and social distancing. Um, they can do that right now without delivering vaccine, without any new medicine, without any, without any technology really, um, and that can limit transmission, but it is a, a tragedy. One of the things that we don't know about what's going on in India is that we do know that there's um, a, a different variant that has occurred in India we haven't, we don't have solid data yet to show that, that that's the cause though of, of the crisis there. We don't know that it's more transmissible or causes more severe disease. It might, but we need, we need that data. Thank you. Uh, kind of a follow up to that, to that question. Um, you'd mentioned before that uh, vaccine supply had kind of caught up to demand here. Um, how is worldwide, you know, sharing of vaccine supply working and should the US be sharing supply or what is your perspective on that? Yeah, there's there's not much sharing of supply. I mean, countries are being real real selfish about this. So you'll 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 hear it in the media as vaccine nationalism. Um, and since the countries aren't sharing, that means countries with less resources or were who were slow to act early um, in the pandemic to secure doses um, are, are really suffering. Um, and this is a real tragedy. This is a worldwide event. And if we just try to protect everybody in the US, that's great, but the viruses don't know borders. And the viruses, you know, if there's viral activity anywhere in the world, that's a threat to everybody in, in the world. Um, not only will there be continuing exposure uh, to people in the world, because even with these travel lockdowns, we still get transmission. There's still some travel. You can't completely shut things down. And there's still going to be pressure to produce these variants. It's evolution, right? The, it's survival of the fittest. So these viruses, um, if they do by chance have a mutation that makes them more fit, that makes them more transmissible, then that's going to be the predominant strain that circulates. And that's going to be a problem for everybody, in, including you know a country like the US who's vaccinating a larger proportion of the population. So I think really uh, we need to pay more attention to sharing vaccine worldwide. Um, and it's particularly important to at least do a minimum to countries with less resources to make sure that the healthcare workers and those who are most vulnerable to severe disease are protected. Thank you. Um, yeah. oh, just talk, I forgot and I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, Dr. Blumberg um, uh, uh, made a request that we uh, donate his speaking fees to a charity of our choice in New Jersey fighting uh, COVID-19. So I just wanted uh, to uh, thank him on his generosity. So, um, Dr. Bloomberg, I have a quick question here. And really, I'm asking because a lot of people are asking and, and they want to know. I don't know if you have the numbers uh, uh, for, for this one. Do the side effects that you spoke about, um, uh, uh, the the blood clots, um, do, do they occur within a particular uh, demographic? Uh, could you, what are your, uh, could you let us know? Yeah, you know, with both the AstraZeneca vaccine um, abroad and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in this country, they're both adenovirus-based um, vaccines. Um, and we've seen this before with other adenovirus-based vaccines. We've got some animal data that shows that these similar um, issues occur with the low platelets and then the blood clots. So we've got some experimental data, and now we've got real-world data that it, that it makes sense. 
what happens is these vaccines cause the development of an antibody, an antiplatelet factor four antibody. And that's the mechanism that results in the low platelet count and then the blood clots that occur. Um, and this is much more commonly occurring in young women. So it's women 18 to 48 years of age. Um, and this occurs between um, five days and three weeks following immunization. Almost all of the cases have been during that time period. And so what we've seen, for example, in some countries in Europe, as they've been saying, they've resumed use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, but they've said, don't get, give it to just people over 50. And to me, you know, in the US, we haven't made that distinction. We've said, give the Johnson Johnson vaccine to everybody over 18 because the benefits outweigh the risks. In my opinion, which is different from the CDC and the FDA opinion, maybe it maybe I'm making it more complicated, but since we do have alternatives available in the US, we've got the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. You know, my recommendation is for young women, for women less than 50 years of age, they should receive preferentially receive the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine so that they don't have to worry about this risk of the blood clots. And then the Johnson and Johnson vaccine can be reserved for everybody over 50 and for males of any age because it doesn't oppose any additional risks. Um, the J&J uh, &J vaccine, you mentioned uh, women from eight to, uh, I think, less than 50, let's just put it that way. Um, does it occur uh, along racial lines? Is there more black people, more uh, whites and things of that nature, or is it scrambled all over? You know, the numbers are pretty small that, that they've seen. Um, and so they, there has not been any clear pattern, but that might be due to small numbers. Um, so, but I haven't seen any racial or ethnic predilection. Thank you. Yeah, so it looks like Lisa has another question. Uh, before then, I just wanted to clarify on behalf of Joshua. Uh, this was several questions back, but he'd originally asked you about um, the percentage of those who are vaccinated and then contract uh, COVID-19. Uh, and there's something you'd said about six to nine months of immunity. Do you remember what you were referring to? Yeah, so um, with the, the vaccine, the with with COVID infection and with COVID vaccines, well, with COVID COVID infection, it appears there's at least three months um, uh, durable immunity. Reinfection with at that time period is very rare. With the COVID vaccines, there's at least six months protection um, against um, disease. The nine months I brought up is because what I've heard from public statements from the Pfizer and Moderna CEOs is that they've suggested that they think there will need to be a booster dose nine months after original infection. I'm sorry, nine months after original immunization. Um, although that that data hasn't been released as far as I know. So they're suggesting that you get your doses, you're vaccinated and nine months later that you get a booster dose. I, I, you know, we'll see that's, you know, there, there's been no publicly available data on that, but that's what they've suggested. Thank you. So, Lisa, go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, I guess this is more shifting a little bit to a public health question with the countries, um, you know, hanging on to the vaccines and not willing to share. Um, has has who really sort of shot itself in the foot throughout the process of this pandemic and lost its credibility as an organization to encourage the sharing of the vaccines or yeah so um my opinion of who leadership is that they they said all the right things at the beginning and they set up a cooperative, um, COVAX, C-O-V-A-X, um, to in order to to provide vaccine at low cost to developing countries, to countries with, with less resources. They had great intentions, but they I think they were naive in a way, and that they were pleading to for um, countries with more resources to do the right thing and to share. And the countries with more resources just didn't. They didn't want to. And that includes you know, the U.S., but it also includes um, you know, many of the European countries and others. It's not just a U.S. thing. Um, many of the countries in the West didn't. And that opened the door for countries like China and Russia to um, do what's now being dubbed vaccine diplomacy 
and they're sharing their vaccines with the less developed um, countries. Um, and, I, you know, that's, that's a good PR move, right, to share a vaccine. So I'd, I'd love to see the U.S. I'd love to see Europe. I'd love to see other vaccine manufacturers share a vaccine. One of the great things that I think in, in terms of turning to something positive is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, that that was developed um, in a way to, that they had always planned to share the technology to any vaccine manufacturer in the world. And they've shared that, for example, to um, Indian um, vaccine manufacturers. So in India, there are two available vaccines. One is based on the AstraZeneca vaccine. One is a more homegrown version. But they're willing to share that technology to anybody. And so that's, I think that that was very generous. Um, um, and I think that, you know, that's a good model to follow in the future. Thank you. Uh, I have one last question, Doctor, uh, about the um, the, uh, the our healthcare system in this country. Uh, you see what's going on, and you mentioned it in your slides as well. How you know a certain uh, uh, ratio uh, in ethnic uh, groups are susceptible and uh, and vulnerable when it comes to COVID nineteen and other diseases as well. Uh, crowded areas, you mentioned, and so on and so forth. So. Um, how do we go from here? What, what do you think in terms of you know, what should be done? Uh, people talk about, especially in the Congress, universal health care, you know, just go ahead and so on and so forth. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, it's obviously it's really complicated. <laughs> it's a very complicated issue. And I'm in the system and I don't understand it completely. Um, you know, insurance is a huge mystery to me. Um, but from my perspective, I'm thinking, you know, the the answer, uh, the answer to overcoming these disparities that we're seeing along racial, ethnic, and other social vulnerability lines, is the only answer to that is some form of universal health care, and whether that's Medicare for all or other forms of universal health care, you know, I, I'm I'm not experienced enough to know. Um, what that would look like. But, you know, we know it can be done. We know other countries have done it. We know that, for example, in the UK, you know, the National Health Service is beloved by by the public. And they, they love having that. They criticize it also, but they still love it. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, in the US, I, I think we could do something very similar to that. Um, there, are, uh, you know, it's a huge challenge, but you know, there are several advantages to that, and that it, you know, might cost less money, and it might ultimately lead to cost savings. Um, you can cut out a lot of administration and cut out a, a, a lot of those administration costs, um, and by providing better health care and better health care access, you can deal with chronic diseases such as um, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and others that, that if you deal with them up front, you can save money later down the line. So there's a lot of models to show that, that, that doing some form of universal health care would be cost savings and result in better health. And that is so true. Um, I can speak uh, on behalf of my community here. Uh, there is a, a lack of trust in the government saying, hey, we've been here. Uh, we've been living in these conditions. Nobody cares about us. And now here you are with your vaccine trying to uh, tell us to be vaccinated. You have your microchip and keep your microchip to yourself. This is a big hurdle for you know, the government to uh, to go over here, I think. Uh, so yeah, I guess the conversation continues then. Yeah, I agree. And one of the things... I, I guess one of the things that we've seen with this is normally what happens is we know that we're going to have these challenges with different communities. We know that we need to need to work at developing um, both messages and messengers that are effective within different communities. And normally what happens with public health is that local and state public health look to the CDC and others to do to develop these messaging and messengers. Um, and that just wasn't done. Um, and so we were really behind that normal processes that take place, um, you know, even with the vaccine rollout, for example, that normally the the at the federal level, what you do, you would have is the federal level leading 
um, some exercises in vaccine rollout to see what the challenges are within states and local communities. We didn't have any of that. So that when the vaccine was rolled out, we did have a lot of challenges, um, and logistical challenges um, at a state level as well as a local public health level. And it's the same with messaging to um, to different communities, to different ethnic racial communities, to um, different areas that we need to make sure that we have um, that we have developed ways that we can communicate the information effectively. And we're just starting to develop that now at the federal level and eventually that'll trickle down to the state and local level. Okay, I think we're getting near to the end of the time. Um, I do have one other question, but I'd like to ask if anybody else does first. Okay, so I, I'd actually like to ask about uh, children uh, because the vaccine is only going uh, out to those 16 and over. Um, should be, we be worried about uh, transmission through children? Uh, do you think there's a point at which that will change and children will get vaccinated as well? Or um, I'd, I'd just be interested in any information about that. Yeah, so we all know that children do have less severe disease compared to older adults. Um, but they, you know, I've seen kids in the hospital. I've seen kids in the ICU on ventilators with COVID and then children also get the inflammatory syndrome, the post infectious inflammatory sy syndrome, the multi system inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC. Um, and um, those kids are very sick and they can transmit to others. This is primarily a, the pandemic is driven by adults transmitting to other adults and to children. Children transmit less to others, but they still can transmit. And they, of course, are a significant portion of the population. We know that we need about 70 to 85 percent of the population immune in order to get our herd immunity, levels of immunity within our communities so that we can not social distance and mask. And so if we don't vaccinate children, it's harder to reach that level. So children definitely need to be vaccinated, but they weren't prioritized because they, it does result in less severe disease. It's only now that um, the vaccines are available that those studies are being done. There's good evidence that the vaccines work in 12 to 15 year olds. And so we're hoping to get the emergency youth authorization from the FDA in the next month or so for that age group. And there are studies down to uh, six months of age. Um, also that are currently um, uh, occurring. We're, we're, we're starting a study in, in young children um, next week here at UC Davis. So, so there's different studies with different manufacturers and I do anticipate that we will get approval and then it will be routinely used in children also. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for your time today for donating your speaking uh, fee. This was an extremely uh, informative uh, and interesting event. I'm glad that we have it recorded as well so that we'll be able to share it with others. Great. Uh, thank right. you. Michael Bloomberg, thank you so much again for gracing us. Um, uh, well, well uh, delivered. And I concur with um, uh, Lauren here. Very informative. And I've Thank learned you. a lot. I've learned a lot. And as I stated from the very beginning, uh, you covered everything, leaving no room for questions. But yeah, <laughs> we found something for you, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. I, thank you. I appreciate being invited. Thank you. Yes. So uh, we will be in contact, uh, and um, we'll contact you very soon, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, Mike is here. Oh, Mike, would, would he like to say a few words to Dr. Bloomberg? <laughs> no, I just want to thank him. I'm on the road. I was getting a medical checkup today, and I'm sitting actually in Chinatown, but I'm impressed with the the quality of the discussion and the and the audio as well. So thank you very much, but I really enjoyed listening. I was uh, felt I needed to be quiet in the corner here. Right. Dr. Bloomberg, Michael Felice is the president of the uh, faculty uh, uh, union association here at the college. So we couldn't it, make it in person. Mask. <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you very much. And thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Bloomberg. Thank you. Nice job.